Thanks a lot. Um, really honored to be here and uh, humbled by uh, all the stories and, and uh, things that I've heard today. It's, this isn't that hard for me. It's, it's going to be hard to relive um, what I'm going to talk about, but it's not hard because I, don't, I think I'm trying to do it because there's a, um, a greater message there. And I should start off by saying I actually do play this thing, the harmonica, um, for a living, actually, which is a kind of a weird thing. But, um, but I'm a really lucky guy. I'm married and I uh, have a son, 19 years old, son Colin, and I uh, live in southern Ontario. And uh, I've had a really, really good career. I've been unbelievably fortunate. Super lucky guy. Um, it's like all of my musical sort of dreams got... Um, they they came true really early. I mean, playing on the Grand Old Opry and traveling all over the world and getting to actually make a living playing this thing. Um, won a bunch of awards and stuff, and things were going really, really well. And I was pretty self-absorbed guy, wanting to be the best harmonica player that I could be. That was sort of my whole thing, was about being the very best harmonica player I could be. And, of course, family and, and all that stuff. But... I got booked to go on this trip, and uh, it was to play for Canadian peacekeepers, and we were headed to um, alert the northern tip of Ellesmere Island and then on to Bosnia. This would be maybe even 13 years ago now. And uh, my life took a giant detour, a giant unplanned detour. Changed everything. Um, what happened was we got on this Hercules aircraft, and it was uh, a gig where you really didn't have to think about anything. We were completely looked after, and all we had to do was really play. We stopped off for fuel in a place uh, called Goose Bay, Labrador, and really remote area. If you were to drive there, the last 1,000 kilometers or so would be on a gravel road. Uh, we had a show to do in Goose Bay, and I'd heard a little bit about this Innu community that was just down the road from Goose Bay. And um, what I'd heard was that they had astronomically high suicide rates and that they were dealing with some really heavy issues like gas sniffing. And it hadn't really hit the media's headlights yet. It just was kind of on the, on the outside, you know. I just heard about it. When, we went, when it was time to play our, our, uh, our show in Goose Bay at the theater, I thought, you know what, this community of Sheshashi is like 20 kilometers down the road. I'll... Um, I'll stir things up and I'll dedicate a song to the kids in that community just to see what would happen. And I did do that. And um, it was just like I reached out and as if I was a dentist and I pushed on a nerve. It had exactly that kind of uncomfortable, um, really uncomfortable feeling. I played Amazing Grace and, and dedicated it to those kids. And it really was like I touched the nerve. And um, I went off the stage and kind of shook up a little bit. But afterwards, um, I was at the record table, and a guy came up to me, and he said, hey, if you really want to see what it's like in that community, he said, sneak away from your tour, and um, I'll drive you out there. He said, I live in that community. So I told one person on this, this military tour that, that uh, I was going to sneak away because, I mean, it's pretty remote, right? And I thought if I don't show up again, at least one person will know what happened. And... Um, I walked out to this old movie theater in Goose Bay. It was early in the morning. It was really cold, and um, this pickup truck came rolling up, and uh, sure enough, it was Ted, and uh, not this Ted, different Ted. <laughs> and uh, so I got in the truck, and we started to drive out to this community called Sheshashi. And as we're driving along, he was telling me stories about what had happened and what had been his experience in the community. And as we're driving along, we'd see little crosses along the, the roadway. And then we'd see uh, areas that had crosses and had kids' toys. And then we'd see things that looked like um, sort of religious icons and, and uh, indigenous as well. And, and uh, way too many of them on this short road heading to Sheshashi. And Ted talked about um, some of the things the kids were dealing with, like gas sniffing. And he said that, those crosses marked where people had died on the road and a lot of times, you know, at, at their own hands and stuff. And you have to remember, I'm the guy, the musician, who has the microphone the night before, right, and talks about the community. 
and now I'm in this truck and I'm riding out there and it's real and he's telling me about this stuff and uh, I was feeling really useless actually and uh, we kept driving and we got to the top of the hill before the town and there were a bunch of uh, mounds of, of dirt and gravel pushed up with crosses in them and he explained that they were where kids were sniffing gas and gas had spilled and and uh, kids had burned to death in the community. So it totally, I didn't know what to do. I mean, it was one thing to talk about it, and it was a complete other thing to actually be there. And it felt creepy. It felt like um, we're driving along this 20-kilometer road, but somehow we just drove off the edge of Canada into some other place that, that I'd never heard about. And um, so he drove me around the community, and uh, told me stories. We went into this one area in the center of town. There was a, a basically a piss-stained mattress that had tarps all over it. And he explained that the kids kind of look after each other. You know, if they're sniffing gas, they'll they'll sleep there, and they're kind of their own family units. The younger ones look after the older ones, or vice versa. Just they look after each other. And uh, anyhow, it was completely flattened. Completely flattened and didn't know what to do, so I'm not a kid's entertainer, but I got him to, to take me to the school. And uh, I went into the school, and it wasn't a fancy school at that time. It, it, was, it, uh, had, it just wasn't a fancy school. But the kids were full of this, this unbelievable energy and power, and uh, I just went into every room of the school and, and played for all the kids. And to tell you the truth, I would have done whatever it took at that point I would have stood on my head, I would have done, I just wanted to connect with them. I just wanted to not be this voyeuristic musician that sticks his head in a community and then comes back with a good story. And um, it floored me. So we took off and we're driving out of town. We round a corner and there, right by a fire, were eight kids with bags of gasoline to their faces, right to their faces, just like this, standing by the fire. And the bags are going just like this, right right to their faces. And Ted stopped the truck, and uh, he said, go do something. And I was scared to death um, for, a few, for a few things. Um, I didn't know if they'd tell me to screw off. They had every right to. You know, why? They'd, I don't know what they're going through. Um, they have every right to tell me to screw off, or maybe they'd throw gas on me. They're right beside a fire. But in that moment, it felt like the right thing to do was just to get out and try and connect and play music. So I got out, and I just played for them. Um, I just took out the harmonicas and started to play. And um, we started to have a dialogue, like these kids, these stereotypical images that you have of these kids. You know, you think they're thugs, or you think they're, you know, they're not like us. They're different. They're, you know, whatever. They're not. They were bored kids. They were like your kids or your neighbors or your grandkids. They were bored. They had nothing to do. They were bored. And they started to talk to me about um, my family, you know, while we're playing and ask me about my son Colin. And, and um, we talked about what it felt like to sniff gas. And, and I'm having this conversation with these kids that you couldn't have with kids that age anywhere. And these are these kids with these gasoline bags to their faces. Like, it totally changed everything. And um, at one point, harmonicas were falling out of my pocket, and a kid dove so they wouldn't hit the rocks to grab the harmonicas. Like, it, I just, I couldn't believe it. And at that moment, it's one of these moments, like, I totally, I totally believe that your life is made up of these moments. And they're all around you all the time. There are these moments where... They can completely alter the way you think and the way you feel and, and your whole DNA. And it was one of those moments where, as an artist, you know, I play music and it feels good and makes people happy, but it was like all of a sudden I realized the real reason for music. It's, we were having a conversation and sharing things that, that wouldn't have happened otherwise. It just, it totally... Um, I'd been altered at that point. I really had everything changed. Uh, a film crew rolled up. Some of it got filmed. I took off on the tour. I had a 
pounding migraine. My face was burnt from the gas fumes. And I went back and we went on to the northern tip of Ellesmere Island, which is past the magnetic pole, near the North Pole, actually. And uh, I got a call um, on a military phone, and I thought my mom had died because she has been really sick. And, and um, I'll never forget going in, and it was like minus 50, and I had all this gear on, and there was a military person handing the phone up to me like this, and I grabbed the phone, and it was the CBC radio show, As It Happens. And um, they would heard about it and saw the footage, and they wanted to talk to me about it. And it was just as if someone had scraped a scab open on my arm. And I ranted. I just, I just ranted for, I don't know, 8 or 12 minutes about that and talked about how embarrassed I was and how Canada shouldn't be like that. No place in the world should be like that. Nobody's kids should have to... I, I just, it really shook me up. So, hung that up, continued on. Um, I think in the interview, I talked about I may have talked about, um, you know what, it felt like my five minutes where the world was listening, like that moment, again, where people were actually listening, and um, and maybe I could affect a change somehow. So I could have made it about building a career. Um, that would have been pretty easy. But what popped into my head was everybody's got an instrument under their bed, you know, somewhere you got an instrument. Um, I gave out my... Uh, name and phone number and internet uh, information and everything all over. I think it went all over North America and parts of the world, you know. And continued on the tour, I went to Bosnia. And when I got to Bosnia, I called home and my wife said, look, what's going on? We've got like a thousand emails and uh, everybody wants to interview you about gas sniffing. And I left, <laughs> well, yeah, I left the harmonica player, right? And now Jane's going, this doesn't make sense. What, what happened? So I returned from there and uh, did the interviews. And in every interview, I just improvised. I just, like a musician does, it's like whatever popped into my head, I'd say it. And, and a lot of times it had to do with instruments. If you, if you got them, I'll go collect them. Let me know where they are. So I ended up getting a bunch of instruments into that community of Sheshashi, like a, a whole transport load. I filled my house up. And I went and did a workshop. I've never done a workshop in my life, but it involved just letting these kids add all these instruments and this beautiful noise. And they kicked out the windows of the treatment center and wrecked the photocopier. But it was beautiful. It was like, it was beautiful. So from that point on, I sort of shelved my career as a harmonica guy. And I started to look for other communities across Canada. And I'd load myself up with harmonicas and I'd go out um, into these flying communities. I'd go out in the bush at night, loaded with harps and look, looking for kids who were sniffing gas. And um, when I found them, I'd hand them harmonicas and we'd start a dialogue. You know, I'd, a lot of times it could be really dangerous, so I'd do something like this, like a... <laughs> so you have to think, this weird guy in a hat, this white guy in a community barking, and these kids would just break up laughing. And I'd hand them harmonicas and it would start the dialogue. So I went, I just went to community after community on my own nickel, starting lending libraries and handing out uh, maybe 10,000 harmonicas over the years in these communities. And um, it changed me in a really good way, made my soul as big as a house and made my music real and, and all these things. But Eventually started an organization called Arts Can Circle, and there's so many good people helping in these places now. But I saw a lot of stuff, and a lot of stuff that really shook me up, and uh, was hard to deal with. Uh, I had a reoccurring dream, um, and it had music in it that I couldn't explain to anybody. And so I tried to play it, and, and um, this is the only way I could play it purpose of this song is to put you in one of those communities more than a brief news flash like the way it goes by so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna play a walk in my dream for you here <clears throat>
Now I know it's a it's a dark song, but its purpose is is to make you feel it. It's to make you feel it. If everybody can just go to that place for two minutes, you can make a giant change. I think that's all I got to say, I guess. Thanks. <laughs>